So as Hal described, Agmethane Advisors is a project developer and we're a, a tiny little consulting firm with a very specific focus. And in general, our mission is to help farmers get paid to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we do that by using carbon markets. And um, so that essentially means we help farms generate carbon credits. And um, I was thinking recently about when I hear people come and say, uh, we want to participate in carbon markets or we want to generate carbon credits. That's, I was trying to think of an analogy and that, that really, it's a lot to me like saying, I want to participate in financial markets or um, which can mean a ton of different things. There are different rules for different programs, different markets. And so um, carbon markets are the same way. So we're just gonna talk through some of those different ones. Our background has been primarily related to anaerobic digestion. And you might notice how mostly talked about anaerobic digestion also. And that's really where the, that's really because there has been a, a viable and practical and usable protocol, um, the, which started as the Climate Action Reserves Livestock Protocol and evolved. I'll talk more about that later. Um, and there are other, uh, and there has been a, a high enough market value to make creating credits using that protocol economically viable. This is a separate revenue stream. It's a separate business plan. And so if market prices are too low, people won't use the protocol. If the protocol is too difficult to implement, uh, people won't use it either and won't create the credits. So um, that's why most of our focus has been on digesters because there's been an opportunity there. But uh, over the past several years, there's now some protocols for enteric methane reductions, um, protocols for um, nitrogen management and protocols for soil carbon storage. So I'll speak to those a little bit today, but I think some of the following webinars in this series, we'll touch on those more. Um, so I wanted to set out three different frameworks for greenhouse gas accounting. Uh, and there are carbon markets uh, in all three of these frameworks. So life cycle accounting um, would be looking at all of the emissions associated with everything that goes into uh, producing a given product. So like, um, like Mahmoud described the the pre-chain or the up-chain emissions would be included. That could be everything that goes into producing a gallon of milk or a megajoule of fuel or uh, many other things. Inventory accounting um, is looking at the emissions of an entire business, or it could be an entire university. It could be some people look at it as just what are the emissions that of their of their own family. Um, and that gets broken into scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. So scope one is direct emissions. Um, say somebody produces heat, uh, produces, makes hot water at a farm by burning propane. That would be a scope one emission or um, the enteric methane from the cows at the farm would be a scope one emission. Scope two is emissions from purchased uh, energy. So for example, you buy an electricity, well, that electricity has a greenhouse gas footprint somewhere wherever it's being made. Uh, and so the mixed uh, portfolio of the electric grid uh, usually determines that, and that varies from state to state, region to region. Um, scope three is really the emissions in a supply chain. So if you looked at, if somebody like, um, I'm going to use chocolate companies um, as an example, uh, there are global chocolate companies. They rely on uh, lots of milk, which is why it's relevant to uh, livestock and manure, and the emissions from the farms make up the primary, the majority of the carbon footprint uh, of those companies' operations. So if they want to reduce, if those companies want to be net zero and reduce their emissions, they need to work with their farm suppliers to reduce the emissions at the farm level in order for, let's take Nestle as an example, for Nestle to meet a net zero commitment. Uh, and then project accounting, is when you go out and implement a specific project. You go start a new activity and you can compare the emissions from before to after. Um, so that would be like you go and build a digester and operate a digester. You can measure the baseline uh, or you can model the baseline from before and then 
um, measure the emissions uh, once the digester is operating. So some of the examples for each of these for life cycle accounting, um, the big one in, in manure circles is California's low carbon fuel standard uh, and the EPA renewable fuel standard. So if you produce renewable natural gas, um, and in some cases, other fuels, hydrogen fuels, so, uh, in some cases, electricity also, um, you would use both of those, the EPA program and the California program, both use uh, a life cycle accounting framework to measure the emissions gram CO2 equivalent per megajoule of fuel produced. Uh, the inventory accounting example um, would be that, say, the chocolate company wants to be net zero, they might provide an incentive to their farm suppliers to reduce the enteric methane emissions. Maybe they um, say, if you go start using a feed additive to reduce your enteric methane, um, either we will give you direct payments, or maybe we will, in partnership with you, uh, create carbon credits and give you some share in the value of those. There's a variety of different ways it can be structured. And um, I use the Nestle example because Nestle is actually doing this in a pilot project with Rabobank. Um, and then project accounting um, would be that digester example I talked to you before. So um, Hal touched on some of these, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them, but integrity of carbon markets is really important because we are creating these ethereal commodities nobody can touch. Um, you can't weigh them. Um, and so one for just climate integrity, you want to make sure they're real. Two for um, there are large transactions being made. This is a this is a huge market that is growing massively. So everybody involved has to make sure that it's real uh, and that it's achieving its uh, greenhouse its climate change mitigation goals. So um, a lot of these important concepts are similar to generally accepted accounting practices for financial accounting. Some of these concepts really are just fundamental and underpin all of the markets and protocols. And so the World Resource Institute and World Business Council for Sustainable Development has the um, GHG protocol and there's the GHG protocol for project accounting, inventory accounting, um, and life cycle accounting that really sets the rules for a lot of these things. There are also ISO standards that do similar thing. So one word of caution, um, in terms of double counting that Hal talked about, as um, more and more agribusinesses want to uh, show they are reducing their emissions and start considering ways to um, work with their farm partners, they may offer incentives to farms to reduce emissions. But if that farm is already undertaking a certain activity, it can't be claimed and selling offsets or another environmental credit like an LCFS credit, it can't be claimed by both entities. So for example, if a farm built a digester in 2008 or something and is, has been selling carbon offsets since, um, and then their, their milk company comes in and says, oh yeah, we, we have a goal to be carbon neutral. Uh, we're gonna claim your reductions towards our carbon footprint. You couldn't do both things. So um, that milk company could probably make some very careful and thoughtful claims um, that the farm supply had a lower carbon footprint than it could have but they couldn't make a claim to the avoided emissions created by that digester if that farm was also uh, selling offsets or a, or a similar product. Um, Kyle talked about voluntary and compliance market. So I'm, uh, I think I'm mostly gonna skip by this one. Um, I'm gonna talk about them some more, some examples of compliance markets. So, um, <clears throat> California has a cap and trade program. Quebec has a cap and trade program. They are actually connected. Uh, Washington has passed legislation for a cap and trade program possible in the future. They might connect as well. Um, cap and trade essentially is there is legislation that leads to a regulation that says the largest emitters uh, in that jurisdiction have to um, keep their emissions below a certain amount. 
and uh, and the regulation creates supply and demand in these markets. So other examples are the US EPA's renewable fuel standard um, and uh, where RIN credits are created. Then there are low carbon and clean fuel standards. Those are mostly different names for the same thing. So California, Oregon has one. Uh, Canada is uh, as passed legislation is developing their regulation. Washington's passed legislation. There's talk of one in New York. Um, New Mexico's tried to pass one. So there's likely to be others coming. Um, and um, I think one thing that's significant to note about the low carbon fuel standards, clean fuel standard, renewable fuel standard, those are all focused on reducing emissions in the fuel sector. So farms can prov produce energy uh, with a digester, but that energy has to get used for transportation in order to produce the credit. So there is a partnership between producer of low carbon fuel and consumer of low carbon fuel in producing that credit. And um, most of the time, the energy molecules don't actually have to get used directly. There's a concept called book and claim accounting um, used in solar and wind markets a lot. Somebody essentially says, uh, I put X amount of energy onto the grid and their partner, their consuming partner says, we took that same amount of energy off the grid. So that can happen in an electric grid or a natural gas grid. Um, but there are some situations in which um, the, there needs to be physical traceability of the fuel. Something um, where I expect we will see more of over time that Vermont, where I'm based, um, is trying to do is pass a clean heat standard. So uh, a program like this, but for um, reducing emissions from heating fuels. Um, so <clears throat> Hal touched on uh, and spoke to the voluntary carbon markets. I'm gonna skip a lot of this, but I just wanted to mention some of the examples. So the Climate Action Reserve, they, they develop their own protocols. They work with stakeholders and experts to write their own protocols that then get released for people to use. And uh, in an agriculture context, the livestock product protocol uh, is one of those. They also have a soil enrichment protocol. The American Carbon Registry does the same thing. They use their, they mostly develop their own protocols. They are a division of Windrock uh, International who people might be familiar with. Um, and they don't currently have uh, any active voluntary market manure management protocols, but they are an approved registry for, um, for the California Resources Board Compliance Offset Livestock Protocol. Whereas these other protocols, VERA uh, has had some different names over time and the gold standard, um, they let people propose protocols and VERA has published some of their own protocols, but that's where if somebody has a creative idea, somebody has a new project type, uh, you can propose that to Vera and there's a rigorous process to get it uh, approved, validated um, by a third party auditor like, like uh, Hal is, and, um, and then you can go and use it. Um, so I wanted to note, since this is the Livestock and Poultry and Environment Learning Center, that in the US, most of the most successful and widely used protocols related to manure management don't allow poultry manure uh, to participate. And that's really just, uh, it's just a, a historical trend, a relic of the past, and it's because in the mid 2000s when the Climate Action Reserve um, drafted their voluntary market protocol, there weren't many digesters being developed for poultry manure at the time. Uh, the industry was focused on dairy and spine manure. So um, CARB didn't write poultry manure into that protocol. Then that protocol got adopted by the California Resources Board for their compliance cap and trade program. Then um, CARB's Offset protocol was integrated into CARB's LCFS pro program. And so, uh, and then that was replicated by Oregon's clean fuel standard. So people like to not reinvent the wheel. And so um, 
in these programs where most of the US manure management related carbon credits have been created, poultry manure is not eligible. There are people who would like it to be eligible. I think it makes a lot of sense for it to be eligible, but you have to convince the uh, parties that be to, to add it. And that, um, that hasn't happened yet. Another significant um, piece to consider in that is that since poultry manure is usually managed in a, 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 a drier um, environment and may not be stored anaerobically, or at least those, that was the historical trends with poultry manure, it was less of an anaerobic baseline, so less of a focus on it. Um, and I'm not an expert on the poultry industry, but I suspect that changing in some places. So I just wanted to quickly talk through um, the voluntary market protocol development process. So if somebody had a new innovative idea, a new way to reduce emissions, or there wasn't already a protocol approved, how would they go about getting one approved? First, you'd identify um, how it is you're gonna go about reducing emissions and you'd have to establish the science to document it so that, um, so that people know it's real. Then you would apply for a project and you would propose that protocol to a registry. You'd have to follow their program rules, which are based around these fundamental um, frameworks of, of environmental integrity and greenhouse gas accounting. And then you'd have to go through a validation. Um, so that's where you'd hire a third party auditor um, to, to review your proposal. And if they agree, then they would provide a report to the registry. Um, and then if your protocol finally gets approved and that's maybe aside from just coming up with your idea and aside from establishing the science, um, probably at least a year, maybe 18 months, maybe two years, depending on the complication of your protocol to get from applying for a project to a registry to approval. Uh, largely because there are so many people coming up with innovative ideas, uh, the registries only have so much time. Um, but once you get to do that, then you would uh, implement your project, you would start doing it, you would monitor it um, to, to, to be able to verify that the reductions you think are going to happen actually happen. You would um, do an accounting uh, and then after you do that accounting with your monitor data, you'd submit that to your third party uh, verifier. After you have the data, you are verifying, if you're planning in advance, you're validating. And then you would, um, once the verifier audits, uh, then you have to submit it back to the registry for them to approve. And then ultimately you'd um, get your credits registered and issued. Um, so let's see, I'm just, thinking through, uh, since we're nearly out of time here, just wanna um, <clears throat> I wanna speak to, I'm gonna skip this one because Hal touched on a bunch of these things, but I just wanted to talk about prices in some of these different markets. So um, in the voluntary markets, often there are how charismatic a project is and how much its story matches the buyer's goals and their marketing um, matter a lot. And so prices on the low side, maybe $3 of, uh, an offset, which is equivalent to a metric ton of CO2 equivalent, maybe on the high side, $40. And there is not one exchange. There is not one place to go and find the price. Um, so there can be, uh, for people developing projects, it can be a challenge in doing price discovery guessing, trying to estimate how much you're going to get paid for your credits if you're going to go through that whole protocol development process. Um, and usually it requires speaking to people who are intimately involved in the market to try and get an indication. Um, the California Resources Board uh, Compliance Offset Program, those offsets currently are selling for about 16 to $22 a piece. Uh, CCO is a California Compliance Offset. Um, but there are different tiers in that market because the way the rules for that program were written, there's those offsets can be invalidated uh, for up to eight years if it's found there was something wrong with them. So for example, um, they were double counted or the, there was a mistake in the accounting and, um, and the offset volume was overstated or the project was out of compliance with environmental and health and safety regulations that apply to it. 
So there are different tiers in the market where you can, you can reduce the invalidation liability from eight years down to three years. And then if your invalidation liability goes away completely, um, and then the way the rules are written, projects that are located in California sell at a premium to projects located outside of California. Uh, and then even some buyers or traders who have really large balance sheets might guarantee to somebody who they're gonna resell to that the offsets won't be, that if offsets are invalidated, they'll go buy more from the market. Um, so there's just lots of, lots of different ways to skin the cat is the, is the point here. Uh, the CARB LCFS credits are currently selling for maybe $60 to $70 a piece. They were up at $190 to $200 a piece a couple of years ago when a lot of people talked about a gold rush for dairy uh, and swine renewable natural gas. Um, the Oregon Clean Fuel Standard credits are currently about $120 and they've been pretty stable there for a long time. Some things to think about is it seems like, well, it seems obvious. Let's if you're developing a project, go sell in the Oregon Clean Fuel Standard. That's where the price is highest. There's more money on the table. But to do that, you have to produce, uh, you'd have to produce renewable natural gas and get it consumed in California, or excuse me, in Oregon for that program. So you have to make sure there is a buyer who has, uh, who supplies fuel in Oregon, who will um, buy your gas and distribute it in Oregon. And you're gonna have a partnership with them. Also the equipment required to produce renewable natural gas, take biogas, clean it up, inject it into a natural gas pipeline is very expensive. So that's why there are in the dairy RNG and dairy digest industry, there are many more third parties who run these projects separately, um, independently of the farms, they might lease a couple acres on a farm and build a project and own and operate it on a farm, rather than farms building and owning and operating these projects themselves because the capital cost is much higher uh, and the focus on operating um, the project is much higher than just running an engine and most farms want to focus on farming. So um, these are just some examples of other project types not related to uh, digesters, but related to agriculture. But I think there's going to be more discussion of those in the coming weeks. So I will stop there and thank you very much.